Hello there and welcome back to the Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for some more crafting projects. Is that what we're calling this? Today I'm going to be showing you my experiments with tie-dyeing geode patterned shirts, fabric, etc. But this is the real reason I wanted to try ice dyeing in the first place is to try and make kind of agate or geode patterned effect fabrics without it being something that was like very repetitive or like available on spoon flower and inside of a pixelated digital image you know I wanted to make something that was a little bit more organic and the ice dyeing definitely gives that effect because you never really know what's going to happen when that ice melts. Now disclaimer here you'll see that I rarely am wearing my gloves in this video and in general my hands if you've been watching my sewing videos recently are completely stained and sad from washing these out without wash without wearing gloves. Um, so a lot of times I'll sometimes I'll remember to wear gloves when I'm doing the project but most of the time I do not put gloves on to wash them out. It just it kind of just ruins my dexterity and the water gets into the glove anyway so I kind of just learned to forego them and therefore my normally hideous manicure is even worse than usual. So do as I say not as I do and get yourself some proper gloves. But with that disclaimer over with, let's jump on over to the blue dying table of doom and get started on these geodes. Oh, all right, one more caveat to say that I explain all of the materials I've been using for my ice dyeing experiments and really go into the basics of the process in my first video on ice dyeing. So of course, that will be linked in the card here. You can go check that out. But I'll be using Procyon, powdered Procyon dyes from Dharma Trading Company today. And everything I'll be dyeing today has been soaked in a soda ash solution. Soda ash lowers the pH, which helps the dye bond to the cotton and rayon fibers that I'll be working with today. And actually a little bit of silk today as well. Um, these dyes are not meant for protein fibers like silk or wool, but you that doesn't mean you can't use them. It just means the results will not be as intended. So I'll get into that a little bit later. But yes, everything has been soaked in a solution of soda ash and water. That is one cup of soda ash to every gallon of water here and um, it's just important that everything gets super saturated in that so that there's a little bit of soda ash uh, in between the fibers ready to interact with the dye and make sure things bond to the fiber. So yes for example this t-shirt here has been soaked in that solution and then it's spun dry in the washing machine so it is just only very slightly damp here. But I'm going to take this string this is called sinew this is a waxed cord I picked this one up on Amazon. I will link to it below. Um, you can also get sinew with Dharma Trading Company as well. That's where I got most of my materials for starting to do tie dye. And then I grabbed a lot of stuff at TJ Maxx, like I explained in my last video. But all I've done here is I grabbed uh, a part of the t-shirt that I wanted to be the center of my geode and sort of loosely arranged everything in a cylinder kind of shape from there. You saw me pick up a spot near the shoulder and kind of arrange this. We're going to tie a lot of geodes today, so don't worry about the specifics too much. And I just am pulling things so that they're not even like the worst thing you can do here if you're looking for a natural and really you know organic shape in the end is to make things too pretty is to make sure things are like folded and laying nicely if anything we want to introduce creases uh and we want things to be messy because the messier this is then the more organic the shape will be in the end what i'm doing here is i'm wrapping around a section of this you know cylinder of fabric basically crumple of fabric i'm wrapping around three or four times because the wax coating on this cord will grip onto itself. So when I go to pull the cord tight like that, make sure you're using, you know, the, I don't know, bundle of cord itself, the ball to do that. Um, they do have special pullers they make for doing this as well, but I'm not going to be doing enough geode tie dye in life that I required any more investing in anything else. But I'm using the strength of the cardboard tube inside of this twine basically to help me use this as a way of pulling this tightly. So um, I'm just wrapping around one, two, three, four times, and then pulling really tight. And you do feel the cord slip against itself and tighten down. It kind of locks into place. You can even, if you're watching me really closely, see where I'm like, where it kind of jolts and the uh, cord locks down on itself, really tightening this up. You do want to pull quite tight. Um, you're going to use, use your hand strength for this one. And that's why I'm using the strength of the cord itself, as opposed to just trying to pull the string, because if you pull the string, you would hurt your hands a lot and wouldn't get as tight as you need to be. But yes, I'm just doing little sections all along here. In the end, I split it off into those two little, I don't know, bunny ears, Mickey ears at the end. Um, and then the rest of this, I'm going to go ahead and still bundle up all into one. And the way I learned to do this was to watch Fun Endeavors tie dye. And they always say that to start at the outside of where the geode, like uh, the rim of the geode, I suppose, as opposed to the center. So you're tying down to the center of a geode as opposed to the outside. Although honestly, if you just wrap this buddy with various sinew sections, like a little caterpillar, you're going to get at least a, a striped agate kind of look. 
But again, I'll be going over this several times in this video because you're going to watch me tie a lot of these today. So this is just the first one. And I'm only going to use two colors of dye on this one. And I chose pagoda red and golden brown here, but I actually changed my mind. So um, I'm going to start with golden brown. And I'm going to put this on like every other section of this. I have my t-shirt uh, completely dried at this point. Actually, I set this aside to dry a little bit. Um, so it dried for another day. So it's completely dried out now. Um, supposedly that helps with getting color saturation. So that's good. I do have a spray bottle of soda ash solution. I usually give things a spritz with that if they're fully dry, just so that the dye sticks to the top of this and doesn't completely just floop off into the bottom of the bin. And I do just have this in a strainer over a bin. So this one will not be dyed in the muck. It'll be elevated out of the melting dye. Um, you can leave them down in the dye. You'll see me do that today as well. I don't notice a giant difference in between the two. Like there's not one that I absolutely prefer um, over the other, but I'm just using a spoon here to tap on golden brown in all these areas. And then I was going to use pagoda red. I changed my mind, grab tangerine, and then I end up going for marigold in the end. So this is a you know marigold kind of shade, a, a really orange tinged yellow, I suppose, um, but like in a golden rod kind of category of things. And I'm just going to tap this on over the seams almost, and then I will do a couple of stripes in the larger bits, but I'm kind of tapping this on gently, uh, not wanting to oversaturate this. This was my first geode ever, so I kind of wanted to see what would happen if I did it this way. Kind of going for a banded agate or a like orange carnelian color situation, and I did want there to be some white in the end, so I didn't want to oversaturate this with dye. And here's some snow I gathered earlier um, that I'm just going to sprinkle on top of this. You can see I have ready ice in the other bottom right hand corner there. I was switching from ready ice to snow because the snow was much more readily available, ironically. Um, so the ice may be ready at the store, but the snow was ready in the yard. So I was grabbing lots of snow and sprinkling that on top here, packing it on. And of course, this is a dye under ice. So the dye goes directly onto the geode. And then I'm putting ice, this time snow, directly on top of that. And here is how that first geode turned out. I do have a couple of red spots of dye up here, which is unfortunate. But the rest of this is pretty um, organic looking for sure. It is almost like what malachite would look like if it were gold instead of green in some ways. The back, I really like this section down here on the lower right got really mm, like strange and bubbly. This like little wavy section here. So I really liked that. But overall, I was pl quite pleased with this as my first geode shirt. You can see there is still a lot of contrast in this. So it, the dye didn't oversaturate. And because I was using golden brown and marigold, both colors are both not very dark. So I wanted to leave some white as a contrast in this. So Something I've learned doing this is if you use all dark colors of dye, it's nice and saturated, but there's not usually enough contrast to, to provide a really striking pattern. So that's something to keep in mind. And here is what the shirt looks like on me. Of course, I have pulled the uh, neckline down over one shoulder just to give this a little bit more style going on because this is just a normal t-shirt <laughs> from TJ Maxx in this case. Nice and soft. It's actually, I think, a cotton rayon blend t-shirt. Um, so it's very soft and dyed quite well. And uh, I think this one will stay in my wardrobe like so. I mean, it's not perfect, but for wearing around the house, for running errands, sure. Now let's go ahead and dye another one. This time I have a t-shirt from Banana Republic that I found at the thrift store. And this is all rayon. So this is, I think, 90% rayon or something like that. So instead of having a cotton rayon blend that's mostly cotton, this is mostly rayon. And I wanted to see this time if I did the twist like you were seeing me do in the first video and started with a twist and then tied it like a geode, if that would give any difference to the resulting um, like dye in the end. And I don't think it actually makes, makes any particular difference in the geode itself, at least not in something that was super, super noticeable. Um, so I didn't really bother one way or another moving on from here. You can see I was moving along, wrapping around a couple of times, pulling that tight until I feel it sort of lock in my hands. Here I'm scrunching up a section a little bit to make sure it's uneven and kind of weird. Uh, you don't want it to be too perfect here. Again, if we're going for natural, if we're going for trying to mimic real stone, we don't any want anything too geometric, like circles, uh, concentric circles. Um, you can, of course, do that if you want a more I guess refined look in some ways, but I want things to be as jagged and queered as possible. So that's what I'm trying to do here. Mess things up as I go along almost, or at least not correct things if they get out of whack. And in the end, I almost like poke the ends of it in back in on itself so that I don't get a perfect bullseye, which is something that Fun Endeavors tie-dye and Belladonna dyes both talk about as well. Those are the two channels that I've been watching the most to learn how to do tie-dye, and I will link them both in the description of this video. I just wrap the cord back around the last few sections and then give it a little loop closed. There are a couple of bits of t-shirt that were sticking out here, so I threw a rubber band on those. And I'm gonna coil this one up into this round container for this. This is actually a uh, round like cookie container from the grocery store. 
that I bought to use as a hat box. But now it has ended up in my dye stuff box instead. So I'm just going to coil this up and actually I'll throw a couple of rubber bands on that to hold that nice and taut on itself. Set that back in the container and then again give it a little spritz of soda ash solution just so this dye will stick on top of it. And I'm going to use all different shades of green on this one, starting with dark green here. So this is obviously looks like dark brown, the dye itself, but I promise it is a dark green dye. So I'm just going to do a stripe across my spiral here and then this one little section, I'm kind of doing this randomly, but mostly striped. Just put this buddy in here, little one random spot and then a stripe across. Yeah, this is not a, I'm not following a formula or a pattern for most of this. I'm just playing around. And that last color was sea glass which is a very like deco green color. It's a very sea foam colored green, which sea glass makes sense. And then I use new emerald green, and then I'm going to use a tiny bit of bright green in here as well, just on one of the sections. And then I'm gonna put snow on top of this or ice on top of this. In this case, it's actually ice. What an idea. So I'll pile some ice on top of here. And then I will actually sprinkle a little bit of the forest green on top of the ice as well. Again, mixing and matching with my dye under ice and dye over ice. I like both. I wanted this in general to be dark green, so I just, you know, sprinkled a little bit of forest green on top and then I did a little line of this um, so that it had one section across the spiral that was a little bit more concentrated. And then of course I need to sprinkle this with a little bit of extra soda ash just to make sure that there's enough in there once this ice melts that can bond with the fabric, although the fabric has been pre-soaked. This probably isn't necessary. It's just a step I see the other tie-dyers I admire take, and so I take it as well. And after this one, was left for its 24 hours, then rinsed and then washed and dried. It looked like this. And of course I was super jazzed about this because it was pretty impossible for me to not uh, like how a green one came out unless something went absolutely disastrously wrong because I just love green and all shades of green. So I've got pretty good saturation on this. Even the areas where I put sea glass, which again is that like sea foam stripe you're seeing on the left hand side. Um, a lot of that disappeared with that forest green being sprinkled on top, but um, pretty good variation of colors going on here. Some more blue toned greens, some more yellow toned greens, lots of light and dark going on here. So I was really happy with the variation in this buddy. It doesn't particularly look like malachite yet, but it looks very fun. I really like these stripes where the dye splits apart the most and almost looks like uh, fractals of quartz or something. And that I think is where the dark green was placed. But here I am in this t-shirt once again to show you what it looks like on a person. The only thing about this t-shirt I don't love is that the sleeves are that weird length where they're just elbow length, which I find to be not the most flattering thing ever. But this shirt is green, so I'm sure I will wear it anyway, especially underneath a jacket, perhaps. And time for another one. Once again, I have my long sleeves from TJ Maxx. I'm going to grab a corner of that and just start wrapping in the middle and then wrap down to where I wanted that uh, center of the geo to be. This is going to have multiple uh, geodes on it instead of just doing one. So far, we've been doing one center and then just wrapping the whole thing radiating from there. This one's going to have multiple centers. So hopefully you can see what's happening. This one ends up looking like some sort of deformed chromosome. So for the science nerds out there, I hope you'll agree. Um, but yeah, I'm just wrapping the center and then I will um, split off into separate little geodes like so. Again, uh, Fun Endeavors tie-dye and Belladonna dyes do a much better job at explaining this. So check out those channels below because I'm still learning and therefore I don't have the verbiage exactly down, clearly. I'm going to arrange this one in one of my containers, but there's just so much extra space here that I wanted to create a way to make sure that the ice stays on top of this. So I created a little foil house for this to sit in like so, and just squeeze that all up. And I'm gonna use different shades of blue and gray on this one. So I have Wedgwood blue here, Houdini blue, gunmetal gray, and then I'll use a little bit of pewter on this as well. Again, all from Dharma Trading Company. So we'll start with gunmetal gray here. I'm just gonna sprinkle that all across the middle of this. Of course, there are like many sections. It's all twisted up and weird. You can do, you know, do one color on these if you want to. Um, the What's creating the geode pattern is the sinew pulled so tight on the shirt. So it's the tie of the tie dye that's creating the white lines in this. So you could do one color over that and have just white lines through one color. Um, obviously I'm using different shades here, but I'm throwing some Wedgwood blue on here and then Houdini blue. Um, this Wedgwood blue is a little bit of a softer blue. And then the Houdini blue is almost like a bright cobalt. Um, so you'll see that in the end. But the navy dye that I have from them, I think it's like the new navy or something. I can't remember exactly which navy I grabbed from Dharma is very strong. So I've learned to kind of stick with my other blues unless I want something very commanding. But I'm going to go ahead and pile ice on top of this. And then I'm going to sprinkle the pewter, the last like mid-tone gray color on top of this. Just like the black dyes, any of the dark colors usually split apart quite well. So I'm throwing that pewter, which looks like brown, 
on top of the ice here, a little bit of soda ash, and I'll set this one aside. And here is what my first multiple geodes tied shirt looks like. And despite sitting in the muck, like it was, uh, this is not sitting in a strainer, it was sitting in its own runoff. You can see there's still plenty of white in the shirt. So even when you leave them in the muck, they still end up with plenty of white. This one's very uh, like spotty, but I still think it's quite fun and pretty. Um, it doesn't particularly look like any geodes I've seen, but it definitely looks like a very strange organic pattern. And you can see that Houdini blue really is a very true blue kind of color, like I was saying. And then the other like gray tones, the warmer tones in this are all from the gunmetal gray and the pewter. And here is this shirt on me with the shoulder pulled down again, paired with some high-waisted trousers from Banana Republic. I try not to shop at modern stores, and I haven't in a very long time, but they had these super high-waisted trousers in wool, and I couldn't resist them just because I never find anything that's actually high-waisted enough for my approval. And you don't have to start with a white t-shirt or item. You can go ahead and use a lighter-ish color. I mean, if we can call this sort of dark mustard a light color, um, but I knew I was going to put even darker colors on top of this. So here I am tying a single geode in a mustard long sleeve t-shirt, again from TJ Maxx, that's where I found this. Um, but I'm just tying that in one long geode again, one of these caterpillar, I guess, styles. I don't know, it's kind of what it reminds me of, like segments of a little bug. Everything reminds me of bugs. It's me, you know, like so. And then I let that dry, spray that with a little bit of soda ash here so I can put some different dyes on top of it. I'm going to start with new black, which obviously black is darker than this. So that will show up contrasty. And the nice thing about using a shirt that has a color to it is if you get any areas of white, it will not be white. It'll be whatever color the shirt started with. You know what I mean? So if you get any areas that don't take the dye very well, they'll still be a color. So you don't have any white spots on your shirt that are unexpected. And I'm going to throw this on most of the bigger sections here. The black, of course, is going to split apart quite a lot because the black dyes usually do so. Then I'm going to take moss green, which again is another one where it's like quite potent. So you actually have to be careful with this, but Took me a while to learn that one, but I'll just dab that on different sections here. Again, no rhyme or reason going on here. Sometimes I cover the entire section with dye. Sometimes I'll cover half a section with it. Sometimes I'll just use a color over where the sinew is. Um, it's not going to penetrate underneath the sinew as long as you have it tied tight enough. But, um, you know, having it on either side of that white line kind of connects the segments together. I don't know. Can I explain why I do the things I do? Never. But here I am covering that with snow. All of that, of course, was dye under ice. Here's the ice. And then once again, I will sprinkle a color on over ice as well. This time I will be using chartreuse, which as we know, is a color that I love quite a lot. Just adding a little bit more snow here with my dirty spoon. It's all right. The thing about like getting little flecks of different colors anywhere or uh, cross contamination is I don't care because I want it to look organic and spotty and weird. So that's like fine with me. But here I'm just going to throw some chartreuse on top of this. Again, a little bit of soda ash and set this aside. Let it process for 24 hours. Rinse it in cold water then rinse it in hot water, throw it in the washing machine, and here is how this one turned out. So you can see there would have been a lot of white space, especially across the back of this, if this had been a white t-shirt, but because it is this mustard tan color, it has got this lighter mustard tan color. And also the shirt color in the beginning is what the color of the lines will be. So it doesn't have white lines in this geode, it has ochre colored lines. So we're learning to geode, we're doing well, we're about to upgrade from shirts, get excited. I promise we will not be making shirts this whole video, um, but I do have one more shirt here. <laughs> and this is a um, rayon, ribbed rayon, lightweight mock neck long sleeve that I again picked up at TJ Maxx. And this I'm tying into one or two geodes and I lost my dye clip for this, but I did one color of dye on this, but you're going to not believe me once you see it. I used the color called Moose, which is a special order dye from Dharma Trading Company, and it's split into this peridot green and purple reddish toned brown. Um, this is a dark brown dye that when used sparingly, the ice will break apart into little shades of blue, different shades of green. It's so fun. I love the way this one came out. This is the one that I will wear like legitimately as opposed to just casually around the house. I'm just really excited about this shirt. But let's go ahead and finally dye some stuff that's a little bit more my style. I, I, by the way, thank you all of you who recommended different places to find 100% cotton shirts and things like that last time. The thing is, I don't actually want t-shirts. Uh, I just want to learn, you know, using t-shirts and then, and, and, you know, graduate to actual fabric, scarves, things like that. And so here we are with some fabric. This is a, uh, the yellow fabric here is a yard of double gauze, cotton double gauze that I've had in my studio for a while because I bought it to make a shirt a couple years ago and it wasn't enough fabric to make that shirt. So it's just been sitting around here we're going to make it into a scarf, like a shawl today. So I have that. And then on top of that, I have a silk habitoy, habitoy, habitoy. I can never say this word properly. Scarf from Dharma Trading Company. Dharma Trading Company also sells the blanks. 
So this is a 44 by 44 inch silk scarf, lightweight scarf here. And I thought if I tied just the scarf, like it wouldn't be bulky like this. It wouldn't have enough heft to it to tie it into the geodes. So I was worried about that. So I decided to layer a scarf over this piece of cotton so that it would have the bulk I thought that this would need for tying it. So that's what I'm doing here. You can see I'm just tying off in the middle and then I'm going again to narrow down to the center of my geode. Again, I'm wrapping around multiple times and pulling the twine really taut. I say twine, sinew really taut so that waxed cord can lock in on itself and be really tight around this. Of course, the uh, downside of having this be puffy is I really have to pull quite tight to make sure that the dye can't penetrate underneath this cord. It is waxed, which helps with that, but just really need to pull down. And you can wrap around, like it's almost recommended to wrap around, you know, three times, pull it tight, and then wrap around a couple more times after that, just to make sure that everything is super locked down and secured. And like, if you wrap around more times, the line will be thicker. Like the white line that is left behind will be thicker. In this case, the white or the sort of orangey goldenrod color line. Um, so you want to vary that. So if you're going for a truly organic stone look, sometimes you wrap around a few times, sometimes you wrap around a lot. Sometimes you want to leave the sections a little bit thicker. Some of these sections or segments here, um, you know, a little bit thinner. You can see I'm pulling so tight that I just broke the sinew there. So I had to re get started on here because um, I was pulling this so tight that I ripped the cord but you do want it to be tight. If anything, that's what I learned from my first round of making t-shirts with this is that I wasn't pulling tight enough. So I was trying to be really careful here with my first silk scarf to pull quite tightly. Now I have heard that using Procyon dyes and soda ash on silk is not as good for silk fibers. If you, I've heard that, you know, rumors that if you leave the silk in the um, soda ash solution for too long or in soda ash for too long, that the fibers might uh, react poorly to the basic solution. Um, so I only left these, I made sure to wash them out uh, probably at like, I don't know, 20 hours, like even before 24 hours, I didn't leave them the full 24. Um, I, I just basically did like overnight and then the next afternoon I would wash them out. So they probably didn't even get the full 24, but it worked out okay. So you can see here what the difference was between the cotton and the silk in the end, because we have this silk scarf and this cotton scarf, they're wrapped together. I'm piling them all under snow together, like so. I'm piling them both under the snow and then I'm going to use the same colors of dye over them. And you can see the two different scarves turn out looking very differently because these Procyon dyes are made for cotton and not for silk. So the, they react completely different with the protein fiber. Silk, of course, made by silkworms as opposed to a plant. So I just took dark brown there and went across and did um, a couple stripes of dark brown. And here's a stripe of dark green. I'm just going to put stripes over this whole thing. And you can see I just like mashed it into the container, covered the whole thing in snow. We have truffle brown. I did a line of moss green on there, just doing dark brown and green shades mostly for this. Now I'll take bronze here, do a line of bronze, like so. Again, kind of being random about it. Then golden brown, fill in the rest of the stripe over here, throw it in here, that'll fit in there. This is all again dye over ice here, as you can see. So this works just as well as going in and filling in each segment of it. You can kind of color in the geodes like a coloring book, or you can just throw dye over the top randomly. I think both ways make really cool looking geodes. I don't even see like a huge difference between the two methods. So this worked just fine for these giant scarves. And this last color was rust brown. And then I again, we'll put a sprinkle of soda ash on top of this forbidden casserole and set it aside. And again, I let this process for probably around 14 hours before I washed everything out. I'm going to do another one of these scarf sets in the cotton gauze and silk for you before I show you the washed out versions of this because my modeling footage of it all is kind of <laughs> messy. So we'll get there, I promise. Uh, the suspense is killing all of us, I know. Um, but here I have another silk scarf over a one and a half yard piece of cotton gauze again, this time from Joann's. Uh, cotton double gauze, they have it at Joann's and they have it on Mood. And uh, the last piece was from Mood, the yellow piece, and this is from Joann's. Uh, I didn't notice a huge difference in the quality. It seemed about exactly the same. I did pre-wash both of these things um, so that they are ready to go and then soak them in the soda ash, let them dry again, put them through the spin cycle in the washing machine to wring out most of the water. So here I am tying this with both pieces completely dry. So they're not even damp anymore um, so that everything is dry and then ready to dye after this. But you can see I did kind of two nodes of the geode on, on that one side and then I wrapped the rest of this mostly as one and I stuck it in here. Uh, stuck it into one of the strainers and I'm going to use actually shades of purple and gray on this because I was trying to go for an amethyst look 
And I think you'll agree with me that that was not achieved, but it still came out fun. So for all of you who've been waiting for me to use purple, now is the time. That first color I used is called Stormageddon. That is a Dharma special order color. And then this is the color Pewter, which you can see looks mauve in its powdered form, but is a, uh, I don't know, almost warm tinged gray. Splits apart quite a lot. So I'll stick some of that on there. Again, I just, you can see I'm filling in some sections and putting it over in like little stripes and others. This next color I have here is Black Cherry, I believe. I can't exactly remember and I can't seem to pause it paused where that is in view. So sadly, I don't exactly remember, but I think that was uh, Black Cherry. And then this is called Nightshade. This is the most purpley purple of the colors I'm adding onto this. So honestly, if I had just sprinkled this whole thing with Nightshade and Pewter, it probably would have come out looking a lot more like Amethyst, but I digress. The last two colors I'm going to use for this are New Black and Gunmetal Gray. So I'll grab that new black and put a couple of sections of black in here. Again, to provide contrast, you want to have a different variety of darks and lights that you're using. And then I'll cover this whole thing in snow. And I'm actually going to put some stripes of Ekru and then Shiitake Mushroom on top of this. Just to add a little bit more of a taupey brown tone to this. Because I didn't want it to be bright purple. I wanted it to be more like a natural kind of purple. So not that you can't find bright purple amethyst because you can. But it's more expensive because it's rare, you know. It's easier to find dull stuff. <laughs> out there in the nature. In the nature. It's a place you visit <clears throat> that feels foreign to me, even though, of course, human beings are of nature as well. A little philosophy with your tie-dye today. It seems essential. Sprinkle with soda ash set aside, and I'm going to show you the rinse out process for this one. So I had the strainer sitting over the container, so I was just pouring out the excess runoff dye here, and then I'll try and rinse the strainer as best I can. It's actually quite hard to clean these with this faucet. I need one of those like sprayer, like shower faucety extensions. But of course, I don't have that on my sink down here. The sink actually is in the corner of the sewing room in my sewing room because before uh, this room was meant for sewing, it was actually my painting room because back when I was a small, small one in my uh, middle school and early high school years, I wanted to be a painter and I didn't know about fashion yet. So those were the days. But obviously, it's been a sewing room for a very long time. But I had a sink down here because I used to paint. But it's useful for this. And you can see my sink is covered in soda ash like crystallized everywhere. So it's messy. And you can see here, I'm not wearing my gloves to untie this because untying all these geodes is really irritating in gloves and the string just gets caught on everything. And then I always, because my gloves only go up to my uh, wrist, I was just getting water in the gloves anyway. And so I gave up. So none of this is actually that damaging to my hands, especially because I wash my hands about 80 times during this process. It's fine, but you know, do as you're supposed to, not as I do but I'm just taking all of the cord off of this. I started rinsing it in cold water just a little bit, but it's gonna take a while to take all this cord off. So I turned the faucet off for that, but I'm rinsing in cold water here to start with. And you know, you can see that uh, water filling up the sink there is like dark, dark purple water. So um, weirdly enough, it doesn't, because like the dye is done processing uh, after having sat for nearly 20 hours, the like chemical reactions aren't reacting any longer. So, it's not like gonna stick to the light areas at this point. So it's not a worry having it sit in this dark dye while we're doing this. Um, what has bonded to the fabric has bonded to the fabric and you know, what hasn't, what will not uh, basically. You're left with whatever white areas you're left with, sadly enough. But this again was that silk scarf and this gauze. So this big bundle is the uh, cotton gauze. And I am going to put that back in its container with a little bit of Dawn dish soap with some hot water just to soak some of the extra dye out of there because it's quite saturated. And then this is the silk scarf. I've noticed with the silk scarves, they really just like only took what they took and that's all you're going to get. So for this silk scarf here, I'm just going to rinse it here until the water runs quite clear. Uh, the cotton takes a long time for the water to run clear. The silk, they rinse out pretty quickly. So after the water was running clear from this scarf, I just let it dry here in the sewing room. I hung it over my curtain rod, over my windows actually. And once it was fully dry, I set that with a hot iron. I don't know if that does anything other than get out the wrinkles, but I don't think the dye is going anywhere. So and it's not like I get my silk scarves wet very often, so I think it's fine. And here is what this purple geode tied silk scarf looks like, draped over my shoulder with a nice dark brown outfit over here on set. Here's what the scarf looks like, how it turned out. I think it's quite fun. Again, I did get a couple areas that were quite light still. Uh, the dyes react completely differently with the silk and the cotton, so you'll see that in a minute when I show you the cotton scarf, you'll see how different the tones turned out. The tone of purple on this is a lot warmer than the cotton. The cotton came out with a little bit more blue, so maybe the blue in the Procyon dyes doesn't dye as well to protein fiber. Again, there's a lot of chemistry going on here. I'm less interested in the chemistry and more interested in just playing around. But yes, does this look like amethyst? 
No. I think there's too many magenta-ish sections coming out of Black Cherry for that to be the case. Um, but it still does look pretty. The cotton underneath still got fully saturated, as you can see here. So this, this again, a lot more cooler tones than that other scarf was, but they're tied together, dyed at the same time, all that nonsense. But this one looks a little bit more like Amethyst, I think. We're getting there. But um, I really, really love how this came out. Even if it doesn't look like natural stone of any kind, I still think it's very pretty and makes me feel very regal having it draped around like this. And you can wrap it around in the front like so. This is a giant uh, shawl. This is a 55 inch wide fabric and then this is about a yard and a half of it. So I haven't d tried dye a piece of fabric that's larger than a yard and a half yet. I'm not sure if it would work. Um, but the geode on this didn't come out super, I don't know, geode patterned. It's a nice random pattern. And it kind of looks like speckled stone, but this one is not a particularly banded agate looking buddy. I still think it's quite pretty though. But yes, I'm taking this giant rectangle shawl, folding it into kind of a triangle here, draping that over my shoulder, tucking one of the corners underneath my belt, like so. Wear a belt in order to facilitate this style of scarfening of it all. It's kind of like a toga-ish wrap. I pulled this over, over my arm on the other side like this to wear it as a shawl. But you can also tuck the back through your belt as well if you want to. This one's quite large, so wearing it like a shawl like this and then we have the yellow scarf from earlier so here is how the yellow double gauze piece turned out again we do still have some large white sections on this but of course because the fabric was yellow to begin with they are yellow not white which is nice i'm really happy with how this one came out you can see the geodes are a little bit more defined here the circles um the radial bits are a little bit more defined in this one and uh, this is like a big enough thing that I can wear it as a scarf. You can wear it in the same way that you would wear any giant scarf. You can wrap them up in several different ways. Wear it as a shawl, wear it as a scarf, wear it over your hair, wear it as a beach cover up, as a like wrap skirt, like a sarong. Um, any giant scarves have many, many, many options with them, of course. And the same is true of these. But this one was only a yard of that. Um, so it's 36 by 55 of that fabric. So it's a little bit smaller than the purple one. But again, you can just kind of fold this into some sort of, you know, random triangle shape and tuck a point underneath the belt like so, tucking into this belt here. And then I will grab a corner, a different corner in the back and tuck that into my belt in the back just because this one is a little bit smaller. So I can get away with having it like this as opposed to trying to throw it over my other shoulder. It doesn't work as well with a smaller scarf. Depends on the size of shawl you're working with like so, but I think this is quite pretty. I can't wait to wear it. But I think both of these cotton gauze shawls came out really well. The dye took really well to this fabric. Um, if anything, there's a little bit too much white space, but something I can dial down on in the future. And for our grand finale of the day, we've gone from t-shirts to scarves. This is a good upgrade. We're starting to dye some yardage. We can maybe make some stuff out of that yardage soon. But before that, I have one last thing to try and dye. This is a mostly rayon, which is what I'm reading about here on the label. Rayon Blend Ribbed Knit Sweater Dress from Amazon. So I will link below to this if you also would like a sweater dress that could be dyed. Of course, it's hard enough to find garments that are rayon or cotton enough to dye them. Um, so anywhere I could find a white sweater dress that was not polyester, <laughs> I was looking everywhere for one. So I finally found one on Amazon. It's not ideal. It's like ethically, I agree with you, but uh, at least it is rayon so we can dye it. It's not any worse than buying a blank t-shirt, I suppose. So eh. But I love sweater dresses and I wanted to go ahead and try and create one that was patterned almost like Jasper. I'm kind of obsessed with Jasper stone right now. Um, that may come up in the future. Those kind of colors are what's on my brain right now. So I wanted to create a dress that was patterned like red Jasper. So I'm going to tie this with a geode tie dye in this thick sweater dress. I kind of chose a couple of sections, one up by the shoulder, one by the hip, that were going to be the centers of my geodes and arrange this as such again trying to keep things quite messy because the messier they are the more naturally stone like this will look in the end and then i'm pulling as tight as i can on this very cloud-like puffy sweater dress and hoping for the best because this dress is not inexpensive to buy as it is so if this went horribly unwearably wrong it would have been quite the expensive mistake so i really had high hopes for this hoping for the best um mostly i was worried about would this end up saturated enough? So if anything, I used quite a lot of dye on this because if it was too dark, that was fine. But if it was too white, then I was going to be bummed. So really trying to pull hard on the sinew here and vary the width of my sections again. Uh, that was like the hip geode. So up here, I'm going to grab one of the shoulders and arrange the rest of this um, and then tie from the middle out to that shoulder where I want the center of the geode to be. 
Again, wrap around four or five times here, pull as tight as I can, wait for that sinew to slip up along itself and tighten down and really lock into place. And you can see I have like the ends of my sleeves loose here. We'll do something about that in the end. But pulling as tight as I can on this giant marshmallow of a garment and we will hope for the best. Ooh. And I'll show you all the colors I used to get the kind of, well, hopefully Jasper effect on this without it just coming out like, I don't know, a bright orange mess. So wrapping down to the center of my geode up here, my shoulder-based geode. It was hard to vary the size of the sections almost on this just because it was so puffy. That to do sections that were quite close together wasn't very easy. If anything, it was easier to do larger sections. So it's out of my way and then I have all this stuff in the middle. So I'm just going to tie this into its own like separate little node of the geode like so. Again, rolling my excess up and really using the uh, twine, like the sinew itself to as a puller to pull this tight because you do not want to try and pull on that string on all on your own. You will cut your hand. And we begin with one of my favorite colors, black cherry. It's just such a pretty color. Also, I wouldn't mind, again, some black cherries. So tasty. Anyhow, I'm going to do a couple of sections of that. We are going to try and vary the depth of color again here to provide a little bit of contrast. This is the color terracotta. Again, all these colors are going to be from Dharma Trading Company. So we put some terracotta on here. Mostly I want this dress to come out slightly terracotta colored. So do a bunch of that through the middle here. Throw a couple of other sections in. I didn't want this to be red and I didn't want it to be orange. I wanted it to be reddish brownish, you know, overall. Next I have ox blood red, so I can put some of that on here. It's kind of a maroony toned red, not a true red. I don't even think I have a true red dye just because it's not a color I reach for, honestly, weirdly enough. Even though uh, I think red looks good with my skin tone. I prefer like a maroon or a cranberry, a blood red, like a darker red. Yeah, in general. And I'm going to use Pagoda Red, which is more of an orangey toned red. Fill in the rest of this little section here. I split that one between Oxblood and Pagoda, just for funsies. Next, I have Truffle Brown, which of course looks redder than the last dye, but uh, that's just because in its dry form, I'm assuming there's a lot of iron in this, it's very red. Um, and the Truffle Brown is a color I've noticed is actually quite a lot lighter. Uh, it comes out quite a lot lighter than like what it says on the tin. And that's because this color is meant to be uh, double saturated. So like if you were to dye something in a vat of this, you would use twice as much dye to get the dark brown color. But obviously when doing ice dyeing, you're just using the powdered form. Um, I'm only layering on as much as I can here. So I really went quite heavy with that truffle color. And that's because I happen to know after trying it a couple of times, it comes out on the lighter side. And then I just put on some golden brown here as well, again, to try and kick this into the more brownish red section of things. Then I will pile on the snow like so. Lots of fresh powder outside at this point. It's actually snowing again today as I speak to you now. We had a break from the snow, but today it is back. In Colorado, it will snow all the way into May sometimes um, randomly, so you never know what you're going to get when it comes to winter. I will go ahead and sprinkle on Ekru and Shiitake again. Uh, Ekru is a good like filler, sort of very, very light color. And then Shiitake splits a bunch. So it provides a good amount of randomness as well um, so that nothing comes out too true colored, I suppose. Because I don't want anything that's like a stripe of a solid color. I want things to be random and organic. How many times will I say it in this video? Don't take a shot. You will be in trouble. But again, sprinkle with soda ash, set aside, really, really, really hope for the best with this one. I let this process for the full 24 hours. Um, if not a little bit extra, I am really bad with the patience side of this craft. Uh, anytime where someone's like, you should try this, where you add on six more steps. I'm like, I can't guys, because the patience required is beyond my capacities. But I rinse the dress out the same way, untying it in the sink with cold water, rinsing it fully with cold water and then with hot water until it ran mostly clear Then threw this into the washing machine. And then I just laid it flat to dry. And here is how the dress came out. So pleased with how this came out. I was very nervous because this was an expensive blank, as it were, to go ahead and try and die. If this all went wrong, it was going to be an expensive mistake if this didn't go the way I had hoped. But really, I could not 
have asked for the colors to come out better, for the print to come out better. I'm super with, happy with how uh, natural and agate like or um, like quartzy this actually looks. It's exactly the colors I was going for and it looks a little bit like Jasper or Agate to me. And this is actually the silk scarf that I tied with the yellow gauze one from earlier. So I had forgotten to show you that. Here's what this looks like. And again, the colors did come out a little bit different on this silk scarf than they did on the cotton. Um, also that cotton scarf started yellow. So obviously the colors are a little bit less yellow based on here. Although the scarf did come out almost more orange than brown. So I used a lot of brown dye on this and it came out mostly orange. So again, I think the scarf looks like Jasper. So I was pleased if a little bit surprised. The temptation to make another one of these in the all green colorways is of course very strong, but because the base dress is kind of on the expensive side, I've decided to put that off for now. But I hope you enjoyed seeing how these geode ice dyeing experiments came together today. I will again link to Fun Endeavors tie dye and Belladonna dyes, both in the description below because they are the channels where I learned how to do all of my ice dyeing, including these geodes from, and they have some amazing color combinations and geodes and tutorials over on their channels that I think will be super helpful for any of you who want to give this a try. I'm definitely gonna be using this dyeing technique in the future. I have done a few more experiments since the projects in this video that you'll be seeing down the line here or in smaller perhaps videos uh, down the line. So if you want to see more ice dyeing and more tie dye experiments for me, always let me know. And thank you as always for watching today. I'll be back here with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming, and crafting real soon. So I'll see you then. Bye.